Hello everybody, this is Mr. McKee for today, and today we're going to talk about the really the start of the French Revolution. How do we get to the point where we go from a, a simple aristocratic, aristocratic lifestyle that you kind of see in this picture here of Rococo art to the violent revolution that the French Revolution is really known for. So where does this all begin? Well, we have to kind of leave the context in France at this point. And what we have in France right now is a society that's built around three different estates. And we're going to break through each of these estates and kind of lay out exactly how this makes up France as a whole. The first estate itself is largely the clergy. Uh, it's the members of the Catholic Church, bishops, cardinals, priests, people who are dedicated to the Vatican and are living pretty great lifestyles, to be truthful. Uh, they don't pay taxes or if they do they pay very few and they pretty much have all their life needs taken care of food is provided for them shelter all the things that you need to survive on a day-to-day -day basis are covered what makes this a more interesting scenario is the fact that the first estate which really only makes up one percent of the population of france owns ten percent of the land of france so we're starting to see a very disparate society here where a very small portion of society holds a pretty significant amount of the wealth and because they contribute so little to the actual government uh, in taxes and everything, it's starting to create a pretty significant imbalance in how the population is distributed. Uh, but the clergy does do one particular thing quite good for France, and because of that, they're not going to be as vilified as much as other groups. And that is the fact that they do have vocations that dedicate themselves to the poor and to educating people, which is important in this now enlightened France, particularly as members of the bourgeoisie become more and more uh, accustomed and familiar with ideas of like Rousseau and Locke, Montesquieu, uh, and, and those other philosophs. Alright, well what about the second estate? Well your second estate is your nobles. They are 2% of the population, they have 20% of the land and wealth of France, but pay no taxes. So that means now 3% of France has 30% of its wealth and does not pay taxes on any of it. That is a very significant scenario that is going to play out really poorly for those groups later on. And then we have the third estate, which is the vast majority of France. They consists really of three different individual groups which we're going to break down independently uh, but what we should know about this group is that they are one not tied to the clergy they have no noble rights and therefore as normal fridge citizens they are required to pay the taxes no matter what their income level is whether they have one dollar to their name or a million dollars to their name so let's look at these groups and start first with the most important and that is going to be the bourgeoisie they are going to be the, the middle class in France. They're your artisans, your bankers, your factory owners. They are the people who have jobs, have some money, a home, a business, and because of that, they're paying a ton of taxes on that. What also is important is that these are the people who are most likely to be literate and most likely to be well-versed in the ideas of the Enlightenment. They may not be as wealthy as some nobles. Some are wealthier than nobles, but they don't have that tax exemption that the nobility does. These are going to be our people who the French Revolution is built around. They're going to be our leaders, they're going to be the people who are most active, and most likely they're going to be the group who were probably going to be a little bit more radical because they're the ones most dealing with the injustices of the system as it is. Next we have the urban workers. The urban workers are the poorest second, or pure poorest segment of the third estate. Uh, these are people who are living in the cities like Paris, like Nice, uh, and they have nothing. They might work in the home of a noble or of a bourgeoisie member. Uh, they might be apprentices, which means they don't get paid yet until they, they become a master in the guild that they're in. But moral of the story is they don't have any money, and unfortunately for them, they are still required to pay a significant portion of what they do have back to the government, and still a portion of what's left after that to the church and their tithe. They are the most susceptible to food shortages, which we will see very early on are going to become an issue in France. And all of this is just really making this group incredibly vulnerable during the, the early stages of the French Revolution. Lastly, we have the peasants. Uh, the vast majority of France is going to be peasants. They're going to be people living out in the rural areas of France who are going to be farming still. 26 million people, or 80% of France's 26 million people, are peasants. 
it's between their taxes to the church and to the nobles and to the, the government, they lose half of their income. But because they live on farms, they are usually a little bit easier for them to get a hold of food as opposed to the urban workers are. Uh, but they're also a little bit more resentful of the clergy because the clergy has a more proactive life in the, the rural areas than it does in the urban areas. Uh, people living in those rural areas really look to the church as kind of the guiding piece of their society. So they are consistently bombarded with the fact that the clergy are living better lives than they are, despite the fact that most of them are going to have vows of poverty. So this is what France looks like at this point. Uh, really what it comes down to is the first and second states are really crushing the third estate with taxes. This is a problem, a situation that is going to really blow out of control. So, let's now all lay the events that are playing all this out. It begins with poor relationship decisions and kind of setting the political mood of France at the time. The king, Louis XV, and his mistress, Madame de Pompadour, are going to be people who are vilified by the Third Estate for being the example of everything that France is not supposed to be. France around Europe is supposed to be this great admired nation under the disguise of what Louis XIV had created, this great palace of Versailles, this culture built around Rococo art. Everything is supposed to be great and wonderful, but unfortunately, the French people are aware that that is not a, the case. It's a facade. It's a veneer around a rotting core. So while the rest of Europe loves France and thinks it's doing great, Internally, France is, is starting to realize some pretty endemic problems in its nation. Bad harvests are making food harder and harder to get a, or get for the average person. Uh, taxes are becoming more and more unwieldy and burdensome that the people can't adjust and accommodate the situation that they are living in. The Enlightenment is providing ideas as to whether or not this really should be what government is like, or this is really should be what our society is built around. And because of Louis and his poor decision making, everything is going to kind of spiral out of control here. So let's look at some of that decision making. Instead of looking to fix the problems within France, Louis the Fifteenth is going to try to take a, an opportunity to really screw the British over if he can. He will get France involved in the Seven Years' War. If you remember, that is a conflict that, while there wasn't a lot of change in Europe, had some pretty substantial changes around the world in colonial territories, particularly for France as they lose huge chunks of territory in the New World and in India. So that is lost income that the government is no longer receiving. That's a problem because now they have to increase taxes on the people to get that, gov that income back to pay for the cost of the war. Crumple that along with the iconic Madame du Pompadour, his mistress, and her really lavish lifestyle, and how she becomes this figurehead for the excess of the monarchy, and everything is really spiraling out of control very quickly, and it's easy for the members of the bourgeoisie and the Third Estate to view Louis as cause of most of their problems. Well, eventually Louis realizes that things are going bad. Uh, and he realizes that most probably the only way he can fix the situation is if he decides to start taxing the nobility and the clergy. And in doing so, this hopefully will ease some of the unrest in Third Estate, help the government become more solvent, which means that it can finally pay its bills. All of that's great. The Third Estate, in theory, is going to love this. Now, you can probably guess pretty easily whether or not the nobles and the clergy are going to love this as well. They won't. It doesn't work. The Estates General, which is the legislative body in France at this point in time, was built around the idea that each estate has one vote. And the clergy and the nobles, having a two-thirds majority, are less likely to just go ahead and give up their tax-free lifestyles. All right, so that didn't work. Sad day for everyone involved. Well, we need another plan. And 1770, realizing he has to come up with a solution, he hires a man by the name of René Maupau as a new chancellor of France. And his goal was to try to develop a plan that would allow the monarchy to tax the nobility. And in doing so, help alleviate a lot of the financial situations in France. 
So he's trying to break the stranglehold of noble tax exemption. He abolishes the parliaments that Louis XIV had created. And he's trying to make the government more efficient to make it seem less like the government is this embodiment of excess and make it so that they don't really need to raise taxes as much. So maybe the nobles would be a little bit more interested in, in going along with the plan. Except we run into a pretty massive problem here. Louis XV dies pretty suddenly. And when he does die, Mao Pao's ideas kind of get tossed to the side. And while his plan and everything were good, and potentially could have helped save France, when Louis dies, everything kind of goes into a bit of disarray. His son becomes the new king, Louis XVI. Uh, Louis XVI is an interesting character. At this point, it's not like he's a small child or anything when he ascends to the throne, but he doesn't exactly have the desire to want to change things. Instead, he's going to focus his efforts on helping this upstart American colony group break away from the British. This is supposed to be for him a little bit of a, a chance for retribution for the loss in the Seven Years' War, and all of this was supposed to be, you know, really fixing his dad's legacy in his mind. Unfortunately, that's not a good decision to make, and we'll explain why in a few seconds here. Side note, his wife is also going to become a major figure in all this. Her name is Marie Antoinette, and she is going to make some decisions that, while not truly that important in the grand scheme of things, are also going to make her a person who's easily vilified by the people as a symbol of excess in Versailles. All right. So let's talk about everything. It's going to be great. Uh, first, we do need to set the context around the rest of France. All of this stuff is taking place. It's not like the peasants are sitting around doing nothing. The bourgeoisie is becoming more and more frustrated and angered about the situation that is taking place. And with the Enlightenment growing faster and faster and becoming more of a prominent social movement in France, we start to see these ideas bleeding into this frustration. So as you see on the page right here, you see an example of some of the French propaganda that's being put around. Unity, undivisible, of the Republic. Liberty, egality, fraternity. Uh, freedom, equality, and brotherhood. Or our death. These are ideas that are very similar to what you see coming out of the American Revolution. Those ideas are transversing across the Atlantic. It's not uh, coincidental that during this time period, one of the most prominent American patriots, Benjamin Franklin, is in Paris at this time. So we start to see those ideas blending back and forth. So this growing resentment of taxation by the Third Estate, the ideas of the American Revolution, of the Enlightenment, and the fact that Louis XVI is not the most proactive in trying to fix things, is really going to start pushing the envelope farther and farther towards revolution. Alright, so let's talk about Marie for a second here. Marie is known as Madame Deficit. Uh, she's known because... When it comes down to it, Louis XVI is very indecisive and doesn't really do much to solve the situation. Instead, he kind of sits back and enjoys life at Versailles. And his queen will also do that. Unfortunately for Marie, she is viewed as a villain by the French people. She's not of French birth. She's actually the sister of the Austrian King Joseph II. And because of this, not only is she not a native French speaker, she's a teenager who is in a country that she doesn't really know or understand. The people don't like her. She relies on just kind of the, the royal lifestyle to kind of make her life better. So she eats a lot of fun foods, uh, drinks, gambles, spends on fashion and things like that. And people view that as just such a waste of money when a country doesn't really have it. So she receives this name, Mad of Deficit, or Lealtrian, which is supposed to be a play off of the word Austrian, and the word for a female dog. You can put those two pieces together as to what that means. So all of this stuff taking place is going to require Louis to call the Estates General into action. Well, this is going to be an interesting scenario, because while he's trying to call his his parliamentary body into action, the people are rallying more and more hatred towards Louis and Marie. And we see this in the way that the monarchs of the time are being depicted and how Louis and Marie are just not on the same level as these people. When we talk about Joseph II, Marie's brother, he's viewed as a servant of the people. Frederick II of Prussia, the Frederick the Great, is known as a father. George III of England is this model example of character, whereas Louis is a decadent pig. Marie is Lealtrian. 
So everyone is building this animosity towards these two people, and everything's just going to continue to fall apart. Louis' attempt to try to put everything together uh, is going to kind of fall up in his face. He appoints a guy by the name of Jacques Necker to the Royal Director of Finances, and Necker re creates a report where he states that most of the problems that France has are because of their support in the American Revolution and because expenses bought by the nobles and the kings. And that was about it. Uh, doesn't really give a good solution as to what to actually do. So this is blowing up in everyone's face. So he appoints a new foreign uh, finance minister, Charles Alexander de Cologne, to fix his France's taxation issues. He wanted to lower internal taxes on basic necessities in order to promote trade with other European nations and also create a universal land tax for those who own land. This would directly attack the church and nobles. Not really attack, but finally tax them. And if this passes, this might have fixed the situation. But unfortunately, it does not. Because again, the nobles and the clergy don't want it to pass. They don't want to pay taxes on the land that they own. They own quite a bit of it. So, grand scheme of things, he will require the Estates General to meet to try to figure out what to do. And unfortunately, this entire situation is just as broken as it was prior. The first and second states are not likely to make changes because they don't want to sacrifice their own quality of living. And the third estate, who is becoming increasingly frustrated, will eventually just step out. They're like, the only opportunity for this to be fair is if you give every delegate one vote. And to be fair, that wouldn't have been fair anyway since there's a lot more members of the third estate. Well, when this doesn't happen and this proposal is tossed out, the third estate leaves the estates general and they pieces out. You want to pay taxes? They don't. Bye-bye. And when they leave, they will form what they call the National Assembly. They will lock themselves into the tennis courts of Versailles after being locked out of the estates general. And in the tennis courts of Versailles, they will pass their tennis court oath saying that we will not leave until we have a constitution. And Louis begins to do what Louis kind of always does and overreacts a little bit. Seeing a mob of potentially thousands of people stuck in his tennis courts refusing to leave, he's like, oh crap, they're going to kill us all. So he calls his army in to deal with this, and this is where everything takes that final downturn. In Paris, which is only 20 miles away from Versailles, the rumors start to appear that Louis is going to dismiss the assembly by force and kill all the members inside. So these rumors create panic, and the panic creates mobs that then try to find the closest example of royal authority that they can find and destroy it. And what they rally upon is a prison called the Bastille. The Bastille is a political prison just outside of France itself, where you sent the people who spoke out against the monarchy. They're generally not your petty criminals, your thieves, your, your violent offenders. They are people that you just wanted to make disappear. So the mobs will storm the Bastille and in doing so kill most of the prison guards and prisoners inside and then raid the armory that's beneath the prison. And once you have an armed mob moving through Paris, everything is over. And the French Revolution has officially begun. Thanks and have a great day guys.